Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Keith Combs, Manager of Financial Empowerment with National Disability Institute, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Thank you for joining us today for the Real Economic Impact Network's webinar on understanding the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. Today's webinar is sponsored by Accorda Therapeutics, Bank of America, and Walmart. Nikia Matthews, NDI's Technology and Media Manager, will provide us with some housekeeping tips for today's webinar. Good afternoon, everyone. The audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure that your speakers are turned on and your headphones are plugged in. You can control the audio broadcast panel via the audio broadcast panel, which you see here below. And if you accidentally close this panel or the sound stops, you can reopen the audio broadcast panel by going to the top menu item, communicate, and then join audio broadcast. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or you prefer to listen by phone, you can dial the number you see here and enter the meeting code, and you do not need to enter an attendee ID. I will also post this number into the chat box for those who might join a little bit late. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar. The captions can be found in the Media Viewer panel, which appears in the lower right corner of the webinar platform. If you'd like to make the Media Viewer panel larger, you can do so by minimizing some of the other panels like chat or Q&A or panelists. And uh, conversely, if you do not need the captions, you can minimize the Media Viewer panel. There will be a question and answer portion at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, please use the chat box or the Q&A box to send any questions you may have during the course of the webinar to either Keith Combs or to myself, Nakia Matthews, and we will direct those questions accordingly during the Q&A portion. If you're listening by phone and not logged into the web portion, you may also ask questions by emailing them directly to Keith at kcombs at ndi inc.org. Please note this webinar is being recorded and the materials will be placed on our website at realeconomicimpact.org. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box to send me, Nakia Matthews, a message, or you may also email me at nmatthews at ndi-inc.org. Keith. Thank you, Nakia. Again, we would like to thank our sponsors today, including Walmart, Bank of America, Accorda Therapeutics, the Burton Blatt Institute, and the IRS, who without their sponsorship and support, we would not be able to provide the webinar such as we do today. If you're not familiar with the National Disability Institute, we are a national research and development organization with the mission to promote income preservation and asset development for persons with disabilities and to build a better economic future for Americans with disabilities. The Real Economic Impact Network is an alliance of organizations and individuals dedicated to advancing the economic empowerment of people with disabilities. The network consists of more than 900 partners in more than 100 cities in the United States. The network includes nonprofits, community tax coalitions, asset development organizations, financial education initiatives, corporations and private sector businesses, federal, state, local governments, and agencies, and individuals and families with disabilities. All of the partners in the Real Economic Impact Network join forces to embrace, promote, and pursue access to and inclusion of people with disabilities in the economic mainstream. In today's webinar, we're going to receive an introduction and an overview of the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. We're going to have a discussion of eligibility and how individuals and families can apply for the FSS program. We're going to receive an explanation of the benefits of the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. And we're also going to hear some examples of how the FSS has directly benefited individuals with disabilities. And there will be approximately 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions and answers for our panelists. 
the out, some of the outcomes that we are hoping um, that you are going to receive from the webinar today are learning the benefits of the FSS, learning the eligibility requirements of the F FSS, as well as resources that are available to those individuals and families that are accepted into the program, as well as the positive impact that the FSS can have for individuals with disabilities and learn some real life examples and of successes of graduates from the Family Self-Sufficiency Program. We have two wonderful presenters with us today. The first um, is going to be Darren Dorsett. He is with the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, Darren is a program analyst and works in the Housing Voucher Management and Operations Division. Prior to joining HUD, Darren worked with the National Association of Counties providing technical assistance to elected county officials on the use of HUD funds. And prior to working with the National Association of Counties, Darren worked with a national consulting firm providing technical assistance to local, state, and federal agencies on a range of affordable housing and community development programs. Darren has a master's in urban and regional planning. And we also have Sharon Hirota with us today who is going to be giving us some real life examples of um, successes that she's seen from individuals in the FSS program. Um, Sharon is currently employed as the existing housing division manager for the County of Hawaii Office of Housing and Community Development. As the division manager, Sharon over, has oversight responsibility for the Housing Choice Voucher or Section 8 program, the Tenant-Based Rental Assistance Program, the Residential Emergency Home Repair Program, as well as an elderly and family housing project. Sharon joined the OHCD in September 2002. Prior to joining the OHCD, she has held positions of increasing responsibility to include human resources and risk management. Sharon also attended the University of Hawaii at Hilo, majoring in business administration. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Darren, who is going to talk to us a little bit more about the FSS program overall. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good, great. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Keith, Nakia, and staff at the National Disability Institute for inviting us to participate in today's panel. I bring you greetings from HUD, the Housing Voucher Management and Operation Division, our director, Lloyd Rawson, and members of our FSS team, uh, Ms. Brianna Benner and Ms. Amaris Rodriguez, uh, who will not be present um, to participate in the program today, in the panel today. Um, I briefly wanted to provide an overview of HUD's Family Self-Sufficiency Program. Um, I'm going to just call it FSS program as I go through some of the slides. Again, to provide a basic overview of the program, um, the overall objective of the program is to reduce dependency on welfare assistance and to promote independence and self-sufficiency. Um, we like to think that it, it is a pretty successful program, yet it's under, but yet it's an underutilized program, and we'll talk about that um, in a little while. Again, generally speaking, um, about HUD's Family Self-Sufficiency Program, um, up until this year, um, under FY 2014 funding under the direction of Congress, there was an FSS program that targeted public housing residents and a separate FSS program that targeted housing choice voucher or Section 8 participants. Um, generally speaking, the rules were the same, um, but again, there was a, a different population that was targeted, one public housing residents and the other Section 8 vouchers, voucher holders. Um, a couple of components of the FSS program, um, so obviously we want to help um, individuals and families um, achieve self-sufficiency. Um, so one way to do that, one component of the program is to provide supportive services. Uh, supportive services, I'm sure you're very familiar with those, um, job training, counseling, child care, transportation, um, education, and other soft type of supportive services while 
participants in the program are receiving housing assistance so that they can actually obtain the education, employment, and other skills necessary to achieve self-sufficiency. Um, another component or a big driving force behind the program other than the participants and agencies that administer the program are PHAs or Public Housing Authorities Action Plan. Um, the Action Plan describes the basic policies and procedures for operating the Housing Authority's FSS program. Um, as part of the plan, uh, they must describe the outreach efforts to reach eligible families. Um, within this action plan, um, they also have to provide a certification of coordination. And that certification um, is provided that the services and activities provided in, under the program have been coordinated with public and private providers, including the job program, um, the Job Training Partnership Act, the Department of Labor, funded job training programs, um, other employers, child care, again, transportation and education and other training type programs. Again, so this is really important um, as PHAs or as public housing authorities describe, what are the outreach efforts? Um, again, are they making sufficient strides to reach uh, businesses in the community? Um, are they doing everything necessary that they can do to help promote the family self-sufficiency program? And again, the whole point of the program is to obviously increase self-sufficiency, but again, we want to make sure that agencies are doing everything they can to provide services to those participants to help achieve their goals. The next slide is on, FS, well, is on FSS administration or administering the FSS program. Um, the FSS program is administered by public housing agencies with the help of program coordinating committees, or PCCs. Um, these PCCs are made up of, of several representatives of, a, of the local community. We're talking about local government, employers, job training agencies, welfare agencies, nonprofit service providers, as well as local businesses. Within these P PCCs, um, there must be a housing authority representative and a, pro and a voucher program participant or public housing residents per the rules in 24 CFR 984.202. And the main function of this committee is to assist the public housing agencies in obtaining public and private commitments for the operation of the FSS program. We like to encourage PCC to actively participate in the development of the PHA's action plan and actually implementing the program. Uh, we constantly encourage PHAs to look at membership of their PCCs and look at ways to help promote um, new services to clients. Um, so oftentimes PCCs have been established and there's no new membership or no new blood into the PCCs. So something um, that we encourage PHAs or housing agencies to do is to go back out into the community, um, emphasize uh, emphasize what they're doing in the FSS program and really to step up the out, outreach efforts in order to serve their clients better. A couple of components or critical components to the FSS program, I'm going to talk about three things. Um, first, a contract. And this is a contract of participation. Um, again, this contract is between the housing authority and participants. Um, this basically specifies what the rights and responsibilities are of both parties. Um, it is a contract. And again, it, it sets forth the general terms and the conditions of participation in the program. Um, again, this is a, a critical part um, of what the FSS program is about um, because, it, again, it lets everybody know up front, this is exactly what's expected of you. Um, it's a five-year um, contract of participation, which could possibly be extended for two years um, given some unusual circumstances. Uh, a second critical part of the FSS program is an individual training and service plan, or I ITSP. And an ITSP is created for each participant in the program. And this plan is basically developed by the head of household and each adult member of the FSS family who decides to participate in the program. Again, so this ITSP, um, as you can imagine, it sets forth all the services that will be provided to the family, and it also articulates the activities to be completed by each family member, as well as the completion dates for services and activities. Um, again, as I mentioned, this is a contract of participation. It's not a contract 
um, of um, it's not it's not a contract. It's something that you just throw away, or there's lack of participation. Um, again, we're constantly asking participants to do their part and the PHAs to do their part as well. And I want to quickly talk about um, interest-bearing um, escrow account, another critical part, another critical component to the FSS program. And again, this is one of the selling points um, of the program. Um, again, when I mentioned that this is a, an underutilized um, program, uh, something that can help um, promote the program is this interest-bearing escrow account. And the whole idea here is to have um, an incentive program or some type of incentive for families to participate in the program, whether or not you're a housing choice voucher holder or whether or not you're a public housing resident. And ultimately, as you achieve your goals um, in your ITSP, hopefully you'll be saving money or you will be saving money and you'll be closer to economic independence. Um, I'll talk a little bit how the, um, how the escrow account works. Um, basically, HUD deposits money into an escrow account every time um, a tenant share of their rent is increased due to a raise in your household income or wages. Um, a quick example, um, you can say a family becomes enrolled in an FSS program and their rent share or their rent is $30. Uh, they don't have any monthly escrow as of yet, um, to say year one. Um, so year two, um, the individual gets a part-time job and their rent share increases to $200. Again, the jump in rent from uh, their rent share, I'm sorry, from $30 to $200, it's a $170 difference. That $170 will be deposited into the family's FSS escrow account. So again, over a period of time, so you can imagine the type of savings um, as individuals go through the FSS program, as they continue to, to receive services and other benefits, and improve their job situation, improve their employment opportunities, um, the families will be able to save say, quite a bit of money. And I'm sure Sharon will talk about that a little bit later um, as she goes through some examples in, in Hawaii. Again, um, within the FSS escrow account, uh, families can possibly receive an interim disbursement um, during the contract term to complete some of their goals. Um, some families have taken out escrow to, um, to pay tuition for college. Um, some have, have been able to um, disperse or receive some of the money so that they can buy a car, and that car will help them um, get to work or drive a little further to get to a better job. Again, that's one component um, of the FSS, um, F, the FSS escrow account. Um, again, in order to claim that, um, the escrow at contract completion at the end of the five years, um, the head of household must be employed and no family member should be receiving or can be receiving welfare assistance. So again, um, you don't participate in the program for a number of years, um, stay on welfare and receive a huge payout at the end of the contract term. Um, in order for that contract to be successfully completed, the individual or the family, uh, the head of household, I'm sorry, has to be employed and not receive welfare assistance. Jumping over to the next slide and talk about who's eligible to participate in FSS. Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, again, uh, prior to this year, um, it was a, a separate program for public housing residents as well as uh, individuals that participate in the Housing Choice Voucher or Section 8 program. Again, both are eligible to participate in the program. Um, however, it is voluntary for, pro for, for families to participate um, as individuals um, get on Section 8 or public housing. They're not required to participate in the program. Uh, but again, the, the targeted population um, that FSS attempts to serve are unemployed or underemployed public housing residents and housing choice voucher program participants. Um, again, there's a little bit of um, misinformation or confusion about um, who can serve in the program. Um, again, individuals or participants with a, with a household head who has a disability, they are able to participate. They are eligible to participate. Uh, again, one component of it um, 
of being enrolled in the program is uh, finding employment. And for individuals with disabilities, that does not mean a full-time, that does not necessarily mean a full-time job. Um, again, the ITSP or the Individual Training and Service Plan, um, again, if, if an individual has a disability, it can, some of the goals within that plan um, can be adjusted so that person with, with disabilities uh, can, can accomplish their goals. Um, a person with disabilities, they may not be able to work for 80 hours a week. Um, I'm sorry, 80 hours biweekly. But again, uh, goals within the plan are adjusted to each family. Um, there's no cookie cutter ITSP, um, and we always encourage public housing authorities to work with individual families so that the goals that are with, that are uh, that are within the ITSP can make sure that they're family specific. Okay. Um, we also encourage PHAs to, to review the plan on a regular basis and to modify it if necessary. Um, we also ask for, um, for for PHAs to work family uh, to work closely with families. Um, so that they can better assess what their strengths are, um, what, what their individual needs are, what the household needs are, and what are some of the barriers, um, as well as setting new goals and really de develop a workable plan um, with actual supportive services that providers in their PCC can, can provide. Again, the whole purpose of the program is for, for families to, to achieve self-sufficiency. Um, it's not about pushing um, a couple of pieces of paper getting families in and out, um, again, we still we want to make an impact on families' lives. Okay. I'm going to jump over to um, how is FSS funded. Um, in the FSS program, um, if you will, the services are not uh, funded by the program. Um, so public housing authorities are required to leverage their public funds or private resources in order to provide supportive services. Um, I know some housing authorities, um, they say, well, how can I do this? Um, again, as I talked about this program being an underutilized program, um, so we found that um, in several best, best practices that um, there, there are companies, there are service providers that are out there, uh, private companies that are out there that are willing to partner with agencies um, with public housing agencies if they knew what the program was about and if they knew that there was um, an impact in communities. Um, so there are several examples um, of public-private partnerships that have worked extremely well. And again, those are the type of partnerships that we encourage. Um, but again, we do ask um, public housing authorities to help leverage resources. Um, in funding for FSS, or Family Self-Sufficiency Program coordinators, it is provided from HUD through annual notice of funding availabilities. There's actually a NOFA that's open right now um, to provide salary and fringe benefits for FSS program coordinators. Um, I want to give a, a brief um, history um, comment on FSS. Um, again, it started in fiscal year 1993, and public housing authorities were required to develop an FSS program for families if they receive new funding for their Section 8 certificates or vouchers or the public housing rental units. Mandatory minimum FSS program requirements for the Section 8 certificate or voucher and public housing programs were based on the number of new units funded. So again, so this mandatory minimum um, applied to several hundred um, so PHAs. And again, they're required to implement an FSS program And really briefly, some changes to the FSS program over the years. When there are new allocations of rental certificates or housing choice voucher or new public housing units after October 21, 1998, um, no longer an increase for mandatory FSS program slots or program size. Um, a PHA's mandatory minimum FSS program size is reduced by one slot for each graduate. So for example, um, if Honolulu had a mandatory program of 25 slots or 25 uh, participants and they graduated to 25, um, again, it was reduced by 25. Um, again, another change um, was that confirmed, con confirmed continued authority for PHA to administer voluntary FSS 
program. And so with that, um, I'm sure we can, I think we're going to take questions at the end. Um, so, but again, if I could, um, again, just provide a, a quick snapshot. Thank you very much, Darren. I think we're going to now turn it over to Sharon. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Hi, Sharon. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, good morning. Uh, my name is Sharon Hirota. I'm the existing housing manager for the County of Hawaii. And one of the programs uh, that I administer or oversee is the FSS program. Uh, so thank you, Darren, for providing that background. Um, this morning I wanted to talk about um, our agency um, and uh, to talk about the successes that we've had in regards to the FSS program. So we uh, started our program in March of 2004, um, and over the last 10 years have been successful in connecting families to local resources um, in their journey to become less reliant on government assistance. Um, at the start, we had some local marketing efforts. Um, we did and continue to do uh, monthly informational meetings. These are meetings that we open up to all participants of our Section 8 program to introduce them um, or to talk about um, both the FSS and the Section 8 home ownership option programs. Uh, we include information in our family briefing packets. Uh, we also include information regarding in, in our annual recertification packets that get mailed out to our participants. We do a lot of re uh, community outreach. Uh, we participate in a lot of the job fairs um, or community resources fairs that are, locate, that are held um, throughout our islands. Um, we also hosted um, this past year um, a VITA tax site uh, to encourage not only our current um, FSS participants, but anyone in our Section 8 programs to learn about uh, the benefits of uh, VITA and free tax services. Um, through our marketing efforts, we've um, there have been around 330 individuals or families that have shown interest in the FSS program. 182 have signed um, to FSS program contracts, and as of today, we have 39 uh, quote-unquote graduates who have met um, the requirements of the FSS program and have um, gone off, are no longer participating in the program. Some of the program challenges um, that were that we face, and I'm sure a lot of the FSS programs out there also face, are uh, getting the family to understand uh, the what's in it for me. Um, for many people, um, they become dependent on government assistance, and so when you talk about um, working towards incentivizing them, um, there's also always a hesitancy um, or a question in their mind is, what do they get out of it? Um, goes on to letting go of government assistance. Um, the other challenge is in understanding the escrow savings account, as Darren explained. Um, for many people, um, trying to understand the concept of if I if I get an increase in earned incomes, how would it impact my current benefits that I'm receiving? but also are, am I really going to receive this escrow account that you're talking about? Um, and then um, financial literacy concepts, uh, we really work on uh, getting people to work on budgeting, savings, uh, looking at their debt and figuring out um, methods or solutions to paying down their debt. Um, many of our clients um, are not bank, and so finding and, and guiding them through um, their banking options that are available in our community. Some of our successes, um, we've had 14 individuals who have attained a post-high school education degree, so they've gone on to college and have received their bachelor's degree, if not higher. Um, we have 52 individuals who have increased their employability skills 
and have moved from being underemployed or unemployed uh, to gaining full-time employment status. And when we talk about full-time employment status, we define full-time as an individual who has worked, who is working at least 32 hours per week. Um, ex uh, continued examples of our successes. Um, this chart shows between 2008 and, 20, and 2014, the number of families um, that were on contract, active contracts, uh, increase um, in their annual income in total, and then the average increase per family. And so we are, except for 2009, we saw a slight drop, but uh, we are seeing uh, our families continuing um, to see an increase in their annual income um, on an annual basis. So we're happy about that. Um, We've, as I've mentioned, we've had 39 program graduates to date, and although our um, required um, graduates was 25, we decided to continue to um, promote this program to our program participants because we see the benefits. Um, and although we've met our 25 um, family quota, so to speak, given to us, we continue to. Um, administer this program. So, so far we've had 39 program graduates. Uh, 22 of them are no longer receiving rental assistance, so they can now afford uh, the total rent on their own. 14 have become um, homeowners. Um, we've dispersed uh, about 200, a uh, little under 300,000 in escrow savings to these graduates, an average of 7,683. And one individual was able to save up to $27,145 uh, in their uh, escrow savings, and they used it to pay down the remaining debt that they had and uh, used the balance to assist them with the purchase of their single-family unit. Um, our 14 successful homeowners that have come through the FSS program Ten of the homeowners um, work through the Habitat for Humanities program. Uh, we have a local self-help um, housing program, um, or individuals were mortgage qualified and were able to obtain a loan directly from uh, the local uh, federal credit union or banking um, or local bank. Uh, one individual, um, one successful homeowner, is no longer receiving mortgage assistance, and so is um, paying the mortgage 100% on their own. We have three who are receiving uh, mortgage assistance um, through our Section 8 uh, home ownership program. So before I continue, I just wanted to um, talk about um, our two of our successful um, FSS program participants um, and uh, Section 8 home ownership uh, participants. Um, two of them um, that are receiving mortgage assistance, um, both of them are um, on Social Security benefits, so on fixed um, income, uh, but through help, through connections to the different community resources available, through their hard work in building their credit, uh, through gifts that they received from their family, they were able to put down um, a deposit and then become homeowners. So one built um, a single family home, um, so she went through the construction process uh, and then eventually uh, purchased the home outright uh, through the Section 8 Home Ownership Program. The other one had the opportunity to, um, he had been living in his, this rental unit uh, for about 10 years. The landlord approached him and indicated that the he was putting the unit up for sale, and uh, uh, he was very used to. He's disabled. He was very comfortable in the unit, and so he approached us in finding out uh, how we could help him uh, work with the landlord in purchasing this home, and we were successful in doing so. So it was a collaboration of very various resources, um, uh, but now he is a homeowner. So we will continue to um, operate um, the FSS program for the County of Hawaii, and we will continue to assist as many families as we possibly can as they work towards becoming self-sufficient 
and um, less reliant on um, rental assistance and or any type of government assistance. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share about our program. Thank you very much, Sharon, and thank you, Darren, for um, all of the great information. Um, we do have quite a few questions that have come in. We've got, uh, it looks like, about 25 minutes left for questions. Um, so please continue to send those questions in. I um, did receive a question. Is there, um, and this could be directed to either Darren or Sharon, is there any follow-up done with the families that graduate from the program, any additional um, resources that they are provided? Um, Anything that you can tell us about that part? Okay, so I can talk about that. Um, in regards to our graduates, um, we do have a um, follow-up system to make sure that, to check on how they're doing, to make sure they're, they continue to be on track. Um, uh, because uh, for a lot of our programs, we open it up to all of our program participants. So if we're having a financial literacy class or we're offering a budget class or we're offering a post-purchase, um, um, post-home purchase class, we open it up to our community. So it may not, it may, although it's geared for or coordinated through our FSS program, um, we see the benefit um, for the community, and so we open the doors to anyone. So it kind of answers two questions. Um, we, so the graduates could come back um, for refresher courses as a community member, not necessarily associated with um, specifically to our FSS program. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Darren, did you have anything to add on that? Oh, got you there. Okay, thank you. Can you, um, Sharon, can you tell us about how you select agencies or other organizations that you work with in your community to provide the financial literacy or any of the other resources that are available through the program? Is that something that your agency provides directly, or do you work with other nonprofits in your local community to be able to provide those services? Okay, so um, we um, don't provide the direct services. We uh, work with different community nonprofits that are experts in delivering um, various services for our um, participants or for the community as a whole. Um, so we, lo we work with local um, counseling services that are out there, um, different agencies that provide um, financial literacy. What my FSS coordinator does is that he does the follow through with the Section 8 participants. So we do a budgeting class and they have homework or they have to do follow throughs. Then he will sit down individually with the FSS participants to address any concerns or specific questions they may have in regards to the training they received. Um, so we do more of the follow through to make sure, did you understand, do you know what you need to get done, is there anything we can help you with. We do a lot of the coordinations, the connections between what the need of the client is and to what the resources are out there in the community. We are also very fortunate in our office is that we sit um, in, an, in a building that is connect, that is, uh, also includes the local employment office, uh, the local unemployment office, the local Department of Human Services that manages our food stamps and financial benefits, uh, another agency that coordinates all of the child care connection. Um, and within our employment office, they host a gamut of different uh, nonprofits that sit within their office. So we are very fortunate where we can just literally walk next door or, you know, with our clients to resources centers, or nonprofits um, without ha them having to get in their car and drive to another entity to get the services done. Also, a lot of the workshops that are held, we do a lot of the hosting. So um, we have a large conference room that we will host and provide free service, and then the nonprofits will come in and provide their services. So that's how we do it here in our local community. Thank you very much, Sharon. And I think some questions came in to, uh, directly to Nakia. So we had a couple of questions came in that were similar. Um, 
I think this question would be a better view towards Darren. Um, a lot of people wanted to know the definition of family, um, and I think a lot of people are asking this question because they wanted to know if a single individual could participate and if that person would be the head of household. Okay, good. it's a good question. Um, an FSS family or participating family, and again, I'm going to read it so straight from, from the regulation. Um, it's that a family that resides in public housing or receive assistance under the rental certificate or rental voucher program and that elects to participate in the FSS program and whose designated head of family, head of household, has signed the contract of participation. So individuals, or I'm sorry, single persons, yes, they can um, participate in the program. But again, one of the, um, the requirements, again, is that you have to be either a Section 8 voucher holder or a resident in public housing. Another uh, re repeat question that we had come in was, um, could you explain the term welfare or government assistance? Does this include programs like TANF, Medicaid, SSI, SSDI, um, SNAP? Could you explain uh, specifically which programs those are? Good. Sharon, do you want to explain a little bit how, um, how income is determined in, in your FSS program, in the FSS program? Sure. Okay, so under the, um, okay, so let me kind of get the question here. Um, so when we talk about the, the term welfare, uh, in my eye, in, in our def definition of welfare, it includes the SNAP and the TANF benefits. When we talk about government assistance, it could be any type of government assistance, including Medicaid, SSI, SSDI, um, or any type of assistance coming into the household. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I hope that helps with the definition. There. Yeah. Darren? Yes. No, I was asking if Darren had anything to oh, add. Okay. Oh, no. Um, but again, um, Sharon covered it sit right there. Um, but again, um, we're still looking at, um, at TANF assistance, et cetera. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, the next question that we had was, um, is there a website that lists PHA activity of FSS for each state, the number of people who have an FSS contract, who have graduated, et cetera? Good. You there? I yep. am. Uh, uh, okay. Darren, I think you need to answer this one. Um, I guess that there's not a – well, yes and no. Um, you, generally speaking, you can contact a housing agency, and generally they're able to provide the number of participants that are in their program. Um, so there's a system called the Public Information, um, the, the Public Information Housing System, um, or PIC system. Um, so that uh, PHAs are required to enter information about residents or participants in the FSS program um, that are enrolled in their program. Um, that information. Um, it's not the perf it's not a perfect system. Um, however, th that's where PHAs or, or agencies um, enter the number of participants that are in the FSS program. Um, currently, I guess in our FY 2014 NOFA or Notice of Funding Availability, um, we provided a list of um, a list of public housing agencies as well as the number of persons that the PIC system has counted that are in their um, that are in their program. Um, however, again, this the PIC system not being a a, a perfect system, um, we also ask or we also ask PHAs to provide um, an updated count of persons that may not be in the PIC system for various reasons. Um, so again, so that, that information is is out there. Um, if, per, if you're interested in finding out 
how many persons are have been enrolled in uh, in particular PHA's um, FSS program um, as of a current date or during a per during a target period. Um, you can look at the FY14 FSS or Family Self Sufficiency NOFA. Um, again, it, it, it's only specific to a particular target period um, in this year's NOFA. So, Darren. Okay. Yeah. Where can you find it? Is it on the web? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it, it's on HUD's website. Um, actually, if you um, if you Google HUD and family self-sufficiency. Um, again, that's a, a very good resource to provide, um, to provide a lot of good information about the FSS program. Thank you. Um, is there an age limit for FSS participation? No, I, no, I, I don't believe so. There's no age limit. Um, okay. But, but again, one of the requirements um, is employment. So again, I'm not sure if a 102-year-old a, a gentleman, you know, I'm not sure that that the program is perfect for him, considering that there's a um, a work component here, a work requirement. Thank you, Darren. Um, Keith, do you have any more questions? Yes, we do have a few more that had, that had um, come in. Um, Bear with me one second so I can locate the question. Um, someone <coughs> asked that they may have missed this information, um, but for individuals with disabilities that are receiving SSI or SSDI, will the program work with them on reporting income to um, SSA as well? Is that something that you could answer for us? Good, Sharon. I think did you talk about that when when we did, when you just mentioned um, when you talked about how income is calculated? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so in regards to that question, uh, in regards to reporting income to SSA as well, um, I'm not. We will not report the income to SSA. But the employer that they are working with will report that income directly to the Social Security Administration. Um, when we work, um, and we do have a few individuals who are disabled receiving SSI or SSDI that are participants in the FSS program, and so we connect them um, with a local resource that can help them understand what the impact is to their benefits, if any, as a as um, with. Um, going from just receiving benefits to benefits and receiving some type of employment um, income. Um, so we we refer them to the experts. Uh, and, and again, we have um, a contract um, that the County of Hawaii was awarded that does um, is a triage uh, that works with um, persons with disabilities um, to kind of coordinate all of their benefits to ensure that uh, they understand what the impact is. So we do not directly report the changes, um, but we will guide them or connect them to the resources uh, or the expert that will tell them um, what to do. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, we also had a question about um, obtaining direct contacts in, in local areas. Is there a, a, a website or how would you how would one go about and this was directly um, regarding San Bernardino County, California, is there how do you go about locating direct contacts in certain locations? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so that if you go to um sit to HUD's website there is um, a listing of public housing agencies by state. Okay. And individuals that are interested, um, if you're interested in finding out whether or not an agency has a public housing, I'm, I'm sorry, has an FSS program, you can you should contact the public housing authority directly. But again, the, the, a component of it is, again, individuals have to be enrolled in um, either the HCV or Section 8 program or public housing. So again, um, you know, uh, again, you, you have to be enrolled in those programs. That's part of the eligibility into FSS. 
Thank you very much, Darren. Um, we have a few more questions. Um, can you discuss the escrow account a little bit in a little bit more detail? When does the escrow account become established? Is it when a contract is signed between the individual and the agency? Um, when money starts going into the escrow account? And what are the reasons that one could withdraw money from that escrow account? Are there st rules and regulations on um, how that money can be used? Good, sure. There, there are certainly rules on interim disbursements on um, on, the, on the escrow account. Um, again, um, the general idea here is to um, is to have an interim disbursement that is related to um, an individual or family achieving one of their goals in the program. Um, so somebody may not be able to um, to withdraw funds to to take a family vacation, or they won't be able to, to do that to take a family vacation. Um, however, again, if it's um, something related to furthering their goals, um, it could be, again, um, college education. Um, it could be taking some vocational classes. Um, again, it, again, those vocational classes, and Microsoft class, those are pretty expensive. Um, again, you may be able to, um, to withdraw some funds um, to achieve some of those purposes or some of those goals. Um, at the end of the contract, and if all the goals um, and all, if all the goals have been met, um, again, you're able to withdraw um, to those monies. Um, again, th there's no restrictions on, on what those monies can be used for um, at the end of the contract period. Um, some families, um, excuse me, some families um, have gone on to purchase homes. Um, some families have, um, again, they gone back to school um, to further their education. Um, but again, I think when when, when families or individuals have participated in the program for such a long period of time, um, generally speaking, um, they continue to uh, they use those resources to help them um, become more self-sufficient. Um, they may, <coughs> excuse me, they may use some of those funds to to pay down debt or any other credit. <coughs> excuse me. Um, to, to pay down debt um, or help re resolve any credit issues. Um, but again, at the end of the contract period, I mean, that money is, is yours or the family's. Again, as long as those, um, as long as those goals have, have been met. Thank you, Darren. Sharon, did you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I don't. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we received is um, some PHAs have suffered budget cuts um, because of cuts in HUD funding. How has this affected F FSS programs and the provision of services that are provided? Um, I guess I, I'll take a, a stab at that. Um, and again, Sharon, you might be able to, to add a, a local context to it. Um, but on a national level, um, we've seen over the last couple of years, or something that Congress has been pushing for, um, they want to see results of the program. And one way, um, one, one way in order to kind of, um, I guess, hold HUD and hold PHAs more accountable may have been by combining um, programs. Um, so again, we don't have separate programs for public housing, separate programs for HCV, um, for, for housing choice voucher participants. Um, as a part of that, um, we've seen, uh, again, there used to be uh, two programs, obviously two different funding streams. Um, so those funding streams this year have been combined. Um, technically, I guess there has not been a a budget cut for family self-sufficiency program coordinator funding. Um, so, but again, um, Congress wants to see results of the program. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I think I've seen uh, I saw a couple individuals um, made from New America Foundation um, that that have really helped HUD and other um, PHAs. Um, kind of come to the table and say, what are some improvements, what are some things that, that HUD, what are some things that PHAs need to do better in order for FSS um, not to take um, those budget cuts that Congress is already thinking about. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sure, um, again, that Congress is looking at everything, um, you know, across the table to say, look, how can we um, avoid any duplication of programs, or duplication of services amongst all agencies, not just HUD, um, and again, I think the FSS program um, 
I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't say it, it's going to continue to be attacked. But again, um, we don't want that. We don't want the program vulnerable to to, to further cuts by Congress. So again, that's why we we always encourage um, the PHAs to do the very best that they can um, in making outreach efforts to to individuals as well as running a, a really good program. Um, and again, that that goes back to HUD too, um, and providing good guidance on, on what program participants um, and what programs, what successful programs does it really look like. Thank you, Darren. Sharon, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, just briefly um, in regards to um, uh, budget cuts, I mean, I manage the, um, the entire program, so inclusive of the Housing Choice Voucher Section 8 program, is, which includes the FSS. We've kind of taken the approach, um, at least from our coordinator, uh, we're fortunate his position has been funded, but we've looked at it that it is uh, a positive way to move people uh, off the programs um, and, and to become successful, whether it be homeowners or renters on their own or to connect them with the resources in the community. And so even with the budget strains, we've kind of taken the approach that we will continue to offer these opportunities to individuals who are interested. Um, we haven't added more people to our program. Um, we are considering that now in this current uh, calendar year uh, to um, kind of allow more people to participate in FSS. But we've really focused um, our efforts on those who have taken initiative to say and are on the right path um, to um, become successful in this program, whether through employment, um, through on gaining um, increasing their employability skills or um, getting furthering their education because we understand that if we can help them, then they are actually the best marketing tool out there to say the program is successful, go, go check out the FSS program coordinator because this is how I've been able to do it. Um, and that's what we use our graduates to for, for more now for marketing to say if I can do it, you can do it, um, and and that's the approach we're taking. Thank you very much for that great information, Sharon. We've got uh, just a couple more minutes, and I've got a couple questions regarding uh, or around eligibility um, in the program. One specifically, is there a minimum level of income required to enter the program? And, um, and along with that, another eligibility question is, if someone's not a U.S. citizen and does not have a Social Security number, are they eligible to apply to be in the FSS? Darren, do you want to take the lead on that one? Yeah, if I can, I'll take the first one. And okay. If you want to go um, to the second one um, regarding eligibility and Social Security. Okay. Uh, Again, there's no income um, requirement. There's uh, there's not a requirement to say you, you have to um, make five thousand dollars say a year, um, but again, you do have to be enrolled in the Section Eight um, program or the public housing um, program. And in order for that to happen, again, there there are some income um, eligibility requirements sit there. Um, again, there there's no um, I guess that there's no um, how you say? It. Again, you don't have to make a certain amount of money in order to participate in family self-sufficiency. If you're eligible, um, if you're eligible, uh, if you if you are an eligible um, voucher holder, or if you a, if you are a voucher holder or a public housing resident, um, you can participate in the program. And again, Sharon, if you could clarify that, um, if I missed any anything there. Uh, no, because I think the key word is eligible for participating in the Section 8 program. Because right. once an individual or a quote-unquote family is determined to be eligible to participate in a Section 8 program, and they've met some, some housing authorities say you must be um, an eligible participant in good standards for 12 months in the, in the Section 8 program before you're eligible for the FSS program. Others don't have that criteria. But I think the key word is eligible. So in regards to the question about a non-U.S. citizen who does not have a Social Security card, uh, they would need to check with their local um, uh, check with their local agency who is administering the FSS program in terms of the definition of eligibility. Um, 
in our in our county we would say the non US citizen uh individual may not be eligible to be the head of household um but may be an eligible member of the household who can then participate as part of the family in the FSS program. So it gets a little tricky when you start talking about a non when you talk about eligibility specific to uh, a makeup of a family that you would need to go one on one with your housing authority. Thank you very much um, for those responses, and thank you for the great questions that we received today. Unfortunately, we um, are running out of time um, for the webinar. If there are any questions that you were not able to get in, feel free to email those questions to me directly at kcombs at ndi-inc.org, and I'll be more than happy to get responses to, um, to those questions um, for you. Um, Again, we'd like to thank um, all of our speakers today, um, Sharon Hirota, Darren Dorsett, as well as uh, Nikki Matthews for our technical support. Um, we welcome you to join us for our next webinar, which is um, coming up on Wednesday, June 11th, 2014 at 3 o'clock. Um, this will be a discussion on joining the economic mainstream. And again, we'd like to um, say a special thank you to our sponsors today, um, Walmart, Bank of America, Accorda Therapeutics, the Burton Blatt Institute, and the IRS. Um, some ways to keep in contact with National Disability Institute is through um, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Flickr, and Tumblr. Again, um, I would want to extend a thank you to Sharon and Darren for your time today. The information was wonderful. And for all of the um, participants that joined us for this great discussion on the Family Self-Sufficiency Program, thank you and have a great day.